On the phone, we have a gentleman who played in the major leagues with the Reds, the Senators, but he achieved his greatest success with the Dodgers from 65 to 73. I remember as a pitching coach with the Phillies because he used to kill our Cubs every year. Claude Oz Osteen. How you doing, Mr. Osteen? I'm doing fine. Uh, good to be with you. Growing up, I was a Cubs fan, but my second favorite team was the Dodgers. It seemed like they had the best farm system in baseball. They always had great pitchers. And it all started with uh, you. I'm not going to say Sandy Koufax or uh, Don Drysdale. It was all you. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I was I was that other guy there, but uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. So you were the third amigo. Well, that's that's probably true. Uh, Sports Illustrated did an article on me one time, and they titled the article "That Other Dodger Pitcher." So. Uh, uh, I felt very comfortable with that tag. How did you know when you had the talent to pitch in the major leagues? How old were you? Well, I tell you, I was uh, I was pitching at a very early age, and I probably went against all the rules that they have today as far as uh, uh, taking care of your arm. I never I never hurt my arm, and uh, I I really honestly think that it was probably because of two things. Uh, uh, one, uh, I had a probably better than average uh, delivery at that early age. And and secondly, uh, I threw a lot to strengthen my arm. You got called up as a 17-year-old. That's unheard of. Was it because the Reds just needed pitching that bad, or were you that much of a phenom back then? Well, that, that, that's kind of the tag that, that they hung on me uh, after my senior year. I was 17, and I had really excelled in high school. Uh, we went to, Our uh, high school team went all the way to the state and won the state. And uh, I think we lost the first game of the year and won – the rest of the games all year, all the way through the state championship. And so I was uh, being scouted quite a lot. And uh, the Reds, uh, they they were the primary ones that scouted me. Uh, the, the Reds and the Dodgers, uh, it just so happened that my high school coach was a what they call a bird dog scout for the Dodgers at the same time. And so I felt a lot of allegiance to the Dodgers in the first place. But uh, Cincinnati, uh, they wanted to sign me so bad that they were willing to put me uh, on a major league roster right out of high school. And, uh, and I couldn't turn that down. It was a great opportunity. And, uh, uh, as it turned out in the long run, it, it was a very wise decision on my part. So were you negotiating with Branch Rickey with the Dodgers and Gabe, Call, Gabe Paul with the Reds? No, uh, Branch Rickey uh, wasn't there then. Uh, it was uh, Al Campanis was the general manager. Uh, Buzzy Bavese, uh was uh, the previous general manager before Campanis and of course, Bavese was there when I signed, and uh, they had a very real good uh, minor league organization uh, at that time, and still do for that matter. Um, and they uh, they pretty much uh, uh, made all the moves uh, in trying to get me. Uh, there was no difference in the amount of money that both clubs had offered me. Uh, the only uh, drawback was is that when I signed, it was at a time where they had what they called the bonus rule was on, and if you got more than $4,000 to sign, uh, it was considered a bonus, and they would penalize the clubs that did it uh, and make that person uh, have to count on the roster for two years. So that was kind of a... Uh, a uh, a deal that curtailed high bonuses because they had started to get out of hand at that time. And when I say out of hand, I'm, 
I'm not talking about the kind of money today. I'm talking about, you know, 65000 50000 and so on in that category. So when you got called up to the Reds, I mean, you're playing for Bertie Tebbets. What was that like? Well, it was the greatest thing in the world because I was I was a Red fan, of course, living in Cincinnati and a suburb, uh, Redding, Redding, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cincinnati. And, of course, I, I was familiar with all the Red players, the names, and and kind of uh, worshipped uh, all of those guys because I was a true baseball fan. And uh, uh, at the same time, I felt that allegiance to the Dodgers because of my high school coach. But uh, uh, Gabe Paul, uh, he really went hard after me. And uh, and what they did to swing me over was uh, they had a veteran pitcher uh, that was near the end of his career, and they – they outrighted him to their triple-A club and made a spot on the major league roster for me. So instead of signing a, a minor league contract, even though the money would have been the same, uh, I would have signed a minor league contract with the Dodgers. I got to sign a major league contract with the Reds, and and I was allowed to join the Reds immediately right out of high school. And... Uh, and they told me I could stay there as long as I wanted to, but when I got ready to go out and learn how to pitch, uh, I was to come tell them, and uh, and they they probably knew me better than uh, than than I knew myself because uh, they knew I wanted to excel and and uh, wanted to play, and uh, they they knew that I would go to them and tell them when I wanted to go out and learn how to pitch. And I did just that. I, I spent a month, a month up there right out of high school. And by that time, uh, uh, I saw how things worked and, and the glamor of the initially uh, joining, you know, a club in the major leagues right out of high school was worn off and, and I was ready to go out and learn how to pitch. So I went to them and asked them to send me out. What was it like when you got to the major leagues? Please? What was it like when you got to the major leagues with the Reds? Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, you know, I had the I had the tag of a young phenom uh, right out of high school. Uh, they hung that tag on me and... They had me rooming with a veteran catcher. Uh, I roomed with a guy named Ed Bailey, who's uh, no longer with us. Uh, but uh, the reason they put me with him is we both were originally from Tennessee. And, of course, he had played many years in the major leagues and was a veteran. And he kind of, uh, between him and... Uh, a couple other guys, Smokey Burgess. Uh, uh, there was a relief pitcher named uh, Herschel Freeman. Those guys kind of took me under their wing and uh, and showed me the ropes. Did you have to face Ted Kuzinski in batting practice? Many times. <laughs> Many he times. He, he was in his uh, heyday then, and... Uh, of course, uh, he had quite a reputation as being big and strong and a home run hitter, and uh, he was a star of the Reds, and uh, I looked up to him. <laughs> was he that intimidating? Well, I, he, he was a little bit intimidating because of, uh, you know, at that time, uh, the Reds had come up with a, a new type of uniform top where the sleeves were cut away. And it would show a little bit more of your arm muscles uh, up near the shoulders. And, of course, with Kluzewski wearing that, it looked like a giant muscle man uh, swinging the bat there at home plate. So I'm sure it was a little bit intimidating for the opposing pitchers. Another young uh, player on that team was Frank Robinson. Did you realize how good of a player he was going to become? 
Yes, I did. Uh, we all thought he was great when he first came up, and uh, I had the good fortune of being uh, a teammate of his. Uh, not only, uh, not only in breaking in with the Reds, and I got to see him uh, have his rookie year where he hit 38 home runs in his rookie year. But I uh, ended up uh, being on the same team with him uh, in the latter part of his career in Los Angeles. A lot of He's... people don't remember that Frank Robinson was once a Dodger. Right. Everybody thinks of him as an Oriole or as a Red. I mean, you forget about the end of his career with the Dodgers, but he could still play. Yes, he could. And uh, uh, we spent a lot of time sitting on a bench talking with each other and uh, – and going over the game that was proceeding, and uh, and it was uh, a, a great learning experience for me. Did it help you starting out as a reliever to learn how to pitch before you became a full-time starter? Well, uh, only in the sense that, that it being a reliever convinced me that I wanted to be a starter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was always a starter in high school and almost everywhere I pitched. And, and of course, uh, I had to kind of pay my dues initially when I got to the major leagues. I, you didn't just uh, walk in there and grab the starting job. You had to earn it. And, uh, and uh, I, I kind of liked it that way. Uh, I felt much better about earning it rather than being given it. How hard was it joining an expansion team with the Senators? How hard was it what? How hard was it on you to go from the Reds to the Senators who were an expansion team? It wasn't hard at all because it was at the, it was a great opportunity for me. Uh, it was a perfect place for me to go and learn how to pitch because I had uh, I had kind of been up and down with the Reds uh, on options, and I had reached the point where uh, I had used up all of my options. So when they sent me down for the third time, it meant that I was going to be a frozen player, and I probably would uh, be drafted because they were going to lose control of me and. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for the Reds to get something for me because uh, I was a prospect, and uh, and they ended up doing just that. They got a couple of veteran ball players and uh, and some cash, and uh, I got to go to a place where I got to start every four days for three years. And uh, what better what better situation could you wish for than that? Uh, where the, you're pitching in a place where there's really no pressure on you uh, other than what you put on yourself. Uh, you really uh, weren't expected necessarily to do anything big. You were just a starter, and they had you in their rotation in hopes that you would uh, progress and become you know, a, a major league pitcher, and that's exactly what happened. It had to be tough on your manager, Mickey Vernon. I mean, a Hall of Famer to manage that team. It was very difficult for him because uh, initially at that time, when I first went there, uh, you know, the Senators were an expansion club along with the California Angels. And the two teams kind of went at uh, putting their teams together in a different way. The Angels uh, went with youth right away. They went with all young players. And the Senators, uh, while they did sign some young players, they initially started with a lot of uh, older veterans who were near the end of their careers. So it was kind of like night and day between the two organizations. And, and of course... Uh, when you've got a situation as a manager where uh, you've got the majority of your team is uh, 
a bunch of guys that were stars at one time but are on their way down, they're not the easiest guys to manage. So after your four years with the Senators, you get traded to the Dodgers for Frank Howard. You had to be so happy to go to the Dodgers with that team because, again, you're going to be with a winning team finally. It was uh, it was probably the, one of the biggest thrills I've I've ever gotten in baseball. I knew that I was joining an elite pitching staff, and uh, you know I I uh, I felt a lot of pressure, but it was uh, it was pressure that I that I enjoyed because. Uh, I think it made me better than I actually thought I was because uh, I kind of put pressure on myself to uh, to kind of uh, match the other guys that I was pitching with. Uh, I couldn't do it like Colfax. I couldn't do it like Drysdale, but I could get the same results. Uh, you know, Colfax would strike out 13 or 15, I would strike out five or six, but we both could get the wins. And that's what it's all about is winning. Did the Dodger fans accept you from the start, or did they have a hard time because Frank Howard was such a great player there? No, they accepted me from the very beginning because I kind of uh, set the stage uh, in my first start. I think I threw a one-hitter against Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh and, uh, and won the game. And so from then on, uh, I think, uh, the fact that I was pretty consistent out there, I gave them seven innings almost every time out. Uh, they liked that. What was Walter Alston like as a manager? He was great. He was a very patient man. Uh, he uh, he knew how he wanted to play the game, uh, the Dodger way, and and his way. Uh, he was a stickler on some little things like pitchers bunting, being able to move runners over, and uh, also in the pitching department, uh, he did not like uh, he didn't like base on balls. He, uh, he really liked people that threw the ball over the plate and, uh, and knew where it was going. And, uh, it's kind of ironic that you bring his name up because about an hour ago before you called, I received a call from someone that I didn't know who it was. And it turned out to be a kid named Robin Ogle, who is Walter Alston's grandson. What is, is he in baseball too, or? Well, no, he he was around us all the time <laughs> when he was growing up, being Alston's grandson, and of course he knew all the players and everything, and and he was a he was a left-handed hitter that played for a little while in uh, uh, just a real nice guy, and of course he's out of baseball now, but uh, we're going to get together next week and play some golf. Sounds great. Did you ever get a chance to meet Jackie Robinson? Was he around the team much? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, initially, uh, when in my very first year, when we went to Dodger Town, uh, of course, all of those older Dodgers that were namesakes like him, Campanella, Snyder, Ferrillo, Hodges, Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, they all, they all were at Dodger Town at one time or another during the course of spring training. You would, you would see them, um, not all at the same time, but, uh, it was kind of a, a tradition that would, it would impress, uh, new people that were coming into the organization, particularly young players, and they would realize, you know, what a great organization this has been. With the Dodgers, when you went to that 65 World Series, they had to be an absolute thrill, and it seemed like you were the top pitcher in that series. 
with a 0.64 ERA, even though you were a one and one, you were the one who basically, after they lost the first two games, righted the ship. Yeah, it was uh, it was a turning point for us in the series, uh, being able to throw a shutout in uh, in that third game. Uh, we had lost the first two. Uh, Don and Sandy uh, had lost uh, through uh, some bad play on our part defensively, and and we just uh, put ourselves in a pretty good hole there. And I was able to win a game and kind of get the ship righted, and uh, and then the rest of them took it from there, and we ended up winning it in seven games. Uh, I uh, I had pitched the third game and the, uh, I believe, the fifth or sixth game, probably the sixth game, and we lost that game. Uh, I was a little disappointed in that game, uh all year long, I don't think uh, Austin ever pinch hit for me in the fifth inning because I was a pretty good hitter. And, of course, I could do a lot with a bat. I could, could hit and run, and he loved to hit and run with me and stuff. And never did he pinch hit for me in the fifth inning during the regular season. And we get to... Uh, we get to the World Series there, and I'm in the sixth game pitching, and I'm down one to nothing, and he pinch hits for me. Did he ever tell and, you why? No, and I never asked him. I, I think I think being in the, the World Series and the World Press being there, the, we were kind of in the limelight, and I think he just – maybe didn't want to be second guessed on that move, you know, in the other way, not for taking me out, but second guess because he didn't pinch yet. And, uh, anyway, he did, he pinch hit for me and I left the game losing one to nothing. And my relief pitcher that came in uh, the next inning got in trouble and threw a three-run homer and put the game out of reach for us. So that's how we lost that game. I only gave up one run in that in that game. Who was the leader of that pitching staff? Was it Drysdale or Koufax? Well, it was always Koufax. It was always Koufax. And, and from a standpoint of, uh, of, of the actual – pitching part and commanding, you know, the opposition, uh, it was Koufax. Uh, Drysdale was a leader probably as much off the field as he was on the field. Uh, he was well-liked, he was respected, and the players looked up to him and you know, we probably saw more of Drysdale than we did Sandy because Sandy Sandy had to have his privacy because he people just wouldn't leave him alone. They, you know, if he had, you know, uh, agreed to do everything that was asked of him, my gosh, he wouldn't have had a spare minute ever. And and I think that just shows the tremendous possible, uh, you know, popularity that he had. Uh, it was kind of like, uh, I was later in my career when I coached here at Texas, I had Nolan Ryan and it was kind of a similar situation because Nolan had thrown all those no hitters and everything. And, and everywhere we went, uh, everybody wanted a piece of Nolan, Sandy, and, uh, Sandy reminded me more of another guy you were involved with, Steve Carlton. He was more quiet, not really wanted to talk to the media. He just wanted to go about his business. Exactly. Exactly. But he he was uh, a lot of fun for us to go out to dinner with and stuff like that. He just, uh, he just didn't uh, cater to the media. He... Uh, I don't know. I don't know why uh, he just felt uncomfortable, and uh, I think at some point in time he probably felt like uh, someone 
wrote something that he did not say, and and from that point on, uh, he chose to do it that way. But he was a great pitcher also. Did the team support his decision to take the Jewish holiday off in the 65 World Series? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we uh, we did, had no problem with that at, at all. Uh, everybody felt like, you know, we had uh, such a strong pitching staff that it really didn't matter too much. If you take Koufax out of the equation and the rest of us were, you can throw us all in a basket and one could win a game just as well as the other. And, of course, if you had Koufax in it, well, yeah. But the fact that we knew he was going to pitch the next day, uh, no, no one had any problem with that. When you went to the 66 World Series and you got swept in four games, do you, but you had an excellent series, even though you lost that game one to nothing. What happened? What was the difference between 65 and 66 with the Dodgers? 66 was a very disappointing World Series for us. Uh, we uh, we knew what kind of team we had. Uh, you know, we had to manufacture runs, and we did not score a lot of runs. But uh, one thing that we usually did well that year is when we faced fastball pitchers, we would usually hit them pretty well because we had a pretty good fastball hitting club. And we just got shut down completely by a couple of fastball pitchers. Uh, Wally Bunker uh, beat me one to nothing. And Drysdale got beat uh, one to nothing. Uh, we both we we got beat back to back one nothing one nothing. Uh, Frank Robinson hit a home run off of Drysdale to beat him, and Paul Blair hit a home run off of me to beat me. So uh, even though we pitched fairly well uh, under those circumstances, we would have, in order to either get a tie or a win, we would have had to throw shutouts all the way through. And we were really disappointed to lose it in four straight. You continued to pitch for the Dodgers through 73. Then you went to the Astros, the Cardinals. It seemed like every year you were pitching over 250 innings. You're getting your close to 200 strikeouts. Did you ever have any arm issues or it just came natural to you? I never had any arm problems. And, and I, I still believe it was because uh, not because I was throwing too many innings. I think it was because uh, the two things I mentioned, I had a pretty fluid delivery. I was always uh, uh, concerned about my mechanics, making sure that they were right. And if I ever had any snags, I would study a lot of film and get it worked out before it caused too much of a problem. And so I was able to stay pretty much uh, fluid throughout my career as far as delivering the baseball. And I didn't put a lot of stress on any of the key parts of the shoulder or elbow. And that's how I was able to throw all those innings and and not not get hurt. Because a lot of players back then were what they call country strong. Were you country strong like a lot of these guys? Oh, I don't. I don't know if you'd call it that. Uh, I wasn't a, a big frame guy, uh, but I, I, uh, I was really, uh, I really believed in in pitching innings. Uh, I thought I was uh, probably. I thought it was more of a detriment to me in giving me extra rest. Uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, you know, an extra day here and there didn't do a thing. It didn't do a thing for me. It, it, yeah, it might have made me just a little bit stronger, but not any better pitcher. In fact, uh, when you get, you're used to having certain stuff, and then all of a sudden you go out there and you've got a little bit of extra strength. Yeah, it did that for me, 
but on the on the downside of it, uh, it, it became a problem trying to harness that extra velocity, and I thought it I thought it it took movement away from me rather than helping me. I depended on movement and control anyway, and and I had that you know uh, fastball at. Uh, 88 to 90, maybe occasional 91. Uh, that was the range that I felt comfortable with and got the most movement out of my pitches, and I could control that. But you start running it up there 92, maybe 93 occasionally, you got you got extra power, and it's going to take away some of your movement. And that didn't do a thing for me. It, in fact, it hurt me. You got the win in that 70 All-Star game and the play that's known as basically real controversial when Pete Rose knocked over Roy Fossey. Well, how did you feel about that play? Did you feel that Pete should have took it easy on that? It was just an exhibition game? No. No, and no one else felt that way either. Uh, in today's baseball, yeah, maybe. But not in baseball at that time. It was about winning, and you would uh, – I, I didn't see anything dirty about the game. I mean, everybody played the game that way. Pete Rose just played it a little bit more energetic than most, and you knew what Pete was going to do. Pete was going to try to score some way, somehow, and he did. He, he had no alternative but to try and knock the ball out of – Fossey's uh, glove, and uh, I guess uh, in today's game, uh, he would be safe anyway because he was blocking the plate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the rule is of blocking the plate anymore. I mean, I'm so, <laughs> used to, I'm so used to the way it used to be now. It's like, what do you mean? What is he supposed to do? You're always taught to block the plate. Uh, the uh, that, that All-Star game uh, and... Most of the ones that I was in in the National League, uh, anybody that that says that the players don't care whether they win it or lose it is entirely wrong if they're talking about that era because that that team showed the most uh, pride and desire to to beat the other league as any team I've ever been on. And, I mean, you're talking about some of the greatest players that ever played the game there. Uh, I remember, uh, not too many people remember this, but, and it's probably a great trivia question, I might be the only person that's ever done this. I came into the game as a pinch runner before I pitched. I never knew that. Uh, Why was that? Gil Hodges. Well, see, we didn't have the designated hitter then. And and Gil Hodges was the manager. And he uh, sent me down to the bullpen to warm up. And he told the bullpen coach to call him when I got ready. And they wanted me to hurry up and get ready as quick as I could. I didn't know what was going on because obviously being a starter, I, I'd never relieved before, not, not in a major like that. But uh, what he did is he pinch hit Willie Stargell and uh, Stargell ended up getting a walk and Hodges called down and had me go in and pinch run for Stargell because that's where he wanted the pitcher in the batting order. He wanted him nine hitters away. And that's how I was able to pitch three innings there in that all-star game so that he didn't have to pinch hit for me. He was a smart manager. Nowadays, you yes, can't he... let a pitcher throw three innings in an all-star game. No, they would hang the manager. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of things have changed about the game. What made you want to go into coaching? 
Well, I always felt, uh, I felt that throughout my career, I, uh, I was constantly, uh, having to really bear down on, on the finite, uh, things about the delivery. Uh, I learned so much about myself and, and I, I did it by on the job training and uh particularly the last five years of my career is when I started thinking that I could communicate all that I had learned uh to the younger players. And so I kind of made it a a desire that last five years of my career that I've I knew I wanted to be a pitching coach and uh I probably uh went way past uh, the law of averages as far as tenure is concerned cuz I coached up there for 15 years. Did you ever favorite team you coached? Did I ever what? Did you ever favorite season in coaching? Well, I got a lot of uh, joy out of uh, my time at Philadelphia uh, and St. Louis. Uh, They they were all enjoyable. Uh, uh, I think the most enjoyable part about being a pitching coach is taking a player who has uh, gone through a lot of adversity and getting him straightened out and, and getting some fantastic results out of it. Uh, I ended up with, uh, I think I had four Cy Young Award winners. Uh, Carlton, uh, I think, did it twice. Uh, you would expect that. But I got a fantastic year out of John Denny. He won the Cy Young Award. I got a fantastic year out of Steve Bedrosian. He won the Cy Young Award right, as, as a reliever. reliever. Yeah, as a reliever. 80, around 88, 89, I remember. Late 80s. Yes, it, yes, it was. So, uh, you know, when, when, when a guy does that much improving and he's coming off of uh, an adverse uh, period of uh, pitching, uh, it, it makes you feel good for him. And you feel good about the job that you've done. What pitcher do you think you got the most out of? What pitcher I, I got the most out of? Yes. I would probably, let me think about that. Um, I would probably have to say, uh, it would be two situations. Uh, I had Bob Force at St. Louis, and I think he ended up winning 20 games. And when I got there, Ted Simmons was a catcher, veteran catcher, and he came to me and he said, man, if you can straighten this guy out, you know, you'll be doing wonders. And... You know, we we ended up getting quite a lot out of him, and then I would say probably probably John Denny in winning the Cy Young Award the year he won it. Yeah, because he was a journey he was a journeyman pitcher. I mean, he came out of nowhere to win that Cy Young Award. Yeah, he was at Philadelphia, and and we went through some times there uh, where uh, I mean there were challenges for me as a pitching coach because. Denny had, at that time, been kind of just a so-so pitcher. He really didn't have a quest for being, you know, having that kind of year. Uh, He had always kind of uh, reverted back to mediocrity. And uh, we had a situation there where, where, you know, I worked with him and worked with him and got him you know, in sync with his delivery and 
he could make pitches all over the strike zone. He could throw the ball anywhere he wanted to, and he had great movement and great control. And so he pitched the first half of the season, and there was no question he had been the best pitcher in the whole National League, or, yeah, in the National League. There was no one close to him, and and he threw ground ball after ground ball. They couldn't get the ball airborne off of him. And so there was a time there near the All-Star game or near the end of the first half where he started showing some signs of kind of going back to what he had always done, and that's just be another pitcher. And I kind of recognized that. And I had a meeting with him and kind of put a challenge to him. And, uh, you know, no threatening thing or anything like that. I just said, hey, let's, I I praised the heck out of him, you know, in being the best pitcher for the first half. And I said, why don't we just try to do the same thing the second half and let's see where the dust settles. And uh, he did. He did. He he accepted it, and uh, he took the ball and ran with it. And uh, he was clearly – that was the year uh, we went to uh, the World Series in 83. When you faced Baltimore again. Yeah, we we lost the series. But, uh, but we had a good year. I think the biggest accomplishment – we had to beat the Dodgers in the playoffs to get to the World Series. And during the season, the Dodgers had beaten us almost every time, but it didn't it didn't phase anybody on our club because I knew that our pitching could hold the Dodgers. We had done it during the season. It's just that they beat us almost every time, one nothing, two to one. It was always a, a, a one-run win for them. And I thought, well, we get them in the playoffs. I know we can beat them. And we did. You had a veteran team, but again, you, you got it done. A lot, a lot of the guys were there in 1980 when the uh, Phillies won it. But again, they just had a, one more run in them, it seemed like. Yeah. Why did you never get to manage in the major leagues? I didn't want to. <laughs> I was around enough of them to know that I didn't want to manage. <laughs> Why was that? Well, I saw what I saw what a lot of them went through. Uh, it's not all uh, ice cream and cake, uh, you know, the way it's portrayed a lot of times. Uh, a lot has to do with how much support you have and and. Uh, of course, I'm speaking of the times that that I was there. Uh, it's a little bit different now. Uh, a manager now has got security and a long-term contract, and and uh, you pretty much know what kind of budget you're going to have today, as far as being able to field a team. You know what kind of team you can field, how much money. You know, what kind of players this money will buy and all that stuff. It's pretty well set. It's just a matter of evaluating who who you're buying, how good he how good he is and and does he fit your slot. But back then you had so much of the unknown, uh you could have one year where you had a good team and the next year you'd have nothing. Uh, and so I saw how agonizing it, it was for some of the managers that I worked for. And, uh, and I was happy doing what I was doing. So who's going to retire first, Vince Scully or Tommy Lasorda? It seems like those guys are never going to quit being affiliated with the Dodgers. (laughs) That's a good question. Obviously, both of them are great baseball people, and, you know, I love both of them to death, but uh, I, I can't answer that question. Uh, I, I hope they go on forever. 
because yeah, Vince Scully started in Brooklyn with the Dodgers, and Tommy, I think he was with them in Brooklyn too. But it just seems like they're they go hand in hand. They're kind of like Colfax and Drysdale. Yeah. What why what makes pitching coaches such good managers? I mean, you had Roger Craig back in your time. You had was yeah. Tommy Lasorda. You've got guys now doing it, like Bud Black. Well, I think uh, those guys that that have gone on and become good managers, I think uh, they're the kind. I think I think there's a lot of things that happen in their in their active career that has led them to become good managers. Uh, I think I could have been a good manager. Uh, I just didn't want to do it. And, uh, but Roger Craig was always a great student of the game. Uh, all these guys were, and, uh, you got, uh, the guy at Boston, you, you mentioned his name. I, I can't oh, think of it. You got Bud Black, who's with... Uh... Yeah, they've all had experience as a pitching coach. Uh, the guy at Boston was a pitching coach. Uh, Bud Black was. And so you learn a lot in that position because you see uh, you're, you're kind of indirectly involved in all the decisions that the manager is making. So you're right with him. And so you you have to be a pretty good baseball person. I know all the years, uh, for 15 years that I was a pitching coach up there, I had my own lineup card with me right in my pocket, and I kept score on it. I kept up with the moves. Uh, I kept up with the pitches that the pitcher was throwing. I kept up with everything on my cards. So basically, I, I was managing for 15 years in my way, uh, uh, right along with the manager. Who do you think the best manager you ever saw was? Well, I tell you, uh, my favorite manager uh, that I worked for uh, was probably Whitey Herzog. Uh I thought he was probably the sharpest guy as far as uh, uh, being ahead in the game uh, with his moves, uh, having a great reason for doing everything that he did. And he probably was the best that I've seen for uh, putting together a team coming out of spring training that was the kind of team that he wanted. Uh, you didn't necessarily have to have a, stu a superstar name to make his team. If you, could, if you could do the job that he wanted in the position he was going to put you in, you could make his team. And you didn't have to have a name to do it. You just had to, you just had to have some talent to be able to, to do what he was going to call you to do. Uh, that involves pinch hitting, pinch running, uh, playing defense, whatever. But he put all the pieces together, and he knew where each guy was and how he was going to use him. The other thing I liked about him was that. He played to win all games in nine innings. You run into a few managers that won't use a guy here in the ninth inning, maybe because he's anticipating extra innings and, and he wants to save him for the next round or whatever. Whitey would use his entire bench to try to win the game in nine innings. And if it didn't work, then he would roll the dice when he got into extra innings and he'd just play it inning by inning and do the best he could. I like that. Who was the best player you ever saw play? 
Willie Mays. What made him so special compared to other guys like Hank Aaron, Roberto Clemente, Stan Musial? Well, I think the best way to describe it is Willie. Willie was cost. Well, he could beat you every way there there was in the game. He could beat you with defense. He could beat you with a home run. He could beat you with a base hit. He could beat you with his glove. And he's the best base runner I ever I ever saw. And more than that. The difference between him and the other guys you named, Clemente, Aaron, obviously they're great. They were great. But I thought Willie wanted to show you all the time that he played that he could beat you in every way. Uh, For instance, uh, if he got on first base, he wanted to steal second. If he got on second, he wanted to steal third. But it was always intelligent moves. Uh, you know, obviously the other guys, uh, Aaron, uh, Clemente, they had the ability to do the same things, but they didn't always uh, uh, seek greatness like Mays did. I mean, I thought there was a difference, and that's, that's only my opinion. 